what are some of the most shocking things that you can think of? The Americans beating the Russians in 1980 in hockey. Darth Vader revealing that he was Luke's father in episode five. Do you remember that when Luke was like, no. I remember as a 10-year-old kid, I was like, no. It was devastating. How about when Princess Diana suddenly died in a car accident? Or the unsinkable Titanic tragically hitting an iceberg? How about when JFK was assassinated or the devastating attack against the U.S. on September 11th? What do you think is shocking to God? What would it take to shock God? Well, in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 12, we find out, and this is God speaking. It says, be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, which means be dismayed or be horrified, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. So what did these people do that was so shocking? Well, they forsook God. Do you know what that means? To forsake someone means to reject them, to turn away. And they forsook God, who is described here as an all-satisfying fountain of living water. They turned their backs on God and instead built their own cisterns. They formed their own gods. Rather than delighting themselves in God, they delighted in other things. And they looked to those things for satisfaction. And it was shocking. Now, why is this so shocking? Well, there are two reasons. Number one, because the Lord is the fountain of satisfaction. Verse 13, again, it says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of of living waters. Do you ever find yourself thirsting for something? For fulfillment, for joy, for rest, or, or for peace, for something that will last? But why do we thirst? Why do we have these longings? It's like there's something more to life, but we're not quite sure what. God has given you that thirst so that he can quench it. The thirst shows that you've been created by God and are designed to find satisfaction in him. C.S. Lewis said, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for desires exist. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there's such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. Well, there's such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that doesn't prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it to suggest the real thing. There is a God who holds eternity in his hands. And he knows how all the pieces of this life fit together. We are meant to live life in relation to this God. And without that relationship, without that connection to the eternal God, we will always be left empty and unfulfilled, longing and ultimately dissatisfied. Those of us who've lived a few more years know that no amount of money or success or pleasure ultimately fulfills. Ask any millionaire on his deathbed. There is only one thing that will truly fulfill, and that is God. Being in a relationship with the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, eternal God. He created each of us so that we could satisfy our thirst in him. He is the fountain of living water. Now, I didn't grow up drinking from this fountain. My 
my life wasn't Christ-directed or Christ-focused. It was very self-directed and self-focused. And, and it was probably no different than, I was probably no different than those around me. I, I tried to find satisfaction in all kinds of things. But these things seemed to promise a lot more than they delivered. I felt like I was always chasing something that I could never quite catch. And then something came from out of the blue and, and caught me. A friend began to talk to me about God. I began to read the Bible. And God used the Bible to open my eyes. And God rescued me in my freshman year of college. For the longest time, I didn't even know I needed to be rescued. I thought I was a good person, at least good enough. But in his mercy and his love, God showed me the many sins I had committed against him and against others. And by God's grace, he he forgave me of those sins and completely changed my life. All of a sudden, I, I found myself in a relationship with God. I, I didn't expect this. But God took a hold of me and transformed me. I began to drink from the fountain of God's goodness and grace, and I found that he was the most satisfying thing in the world. And that the fountains that I had been drinking from were really just frauds. Jesus is what my life is all about. I I feel this a thousand times more strongly than when I was first saved. He's everything to me. He's my life. He has absolutely and completely transformed me. He's brought me so much joy and peace and and satisfaction. I used to be so angry and controlling. I was terribly arrogant and selfish. Now, I can still struggle with those things, but I'm different. I'm, I'm a new creation because of what Christ has done. And I can't even describe to you the gratefulness that I feel in my heart for how he has changed me. His love is like no love that I have ever experienced in my life. He has been so faithful to me and so kind and so wise and so good. He's not a stingy God who insists that we not do anything that will bring us joy. No, he is the fountain of life. He's the fountain that I drink from and he has truly fulfilled me. God offers us fulfillment, but it's not like one choice among many. It's not like, you know, you choose one fountain and I choose another fountain. Like you like French fountains, but I like Italian fountains. Or you choose God, but some people choose Buddha or Allah. Or some people uh, worship football teams or a job or a relationship. No, there is only one God. And the rest are false gods. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. We as creatures have an obligation to orient our lives to God. Why? Well, because God made us and because God is a relational God. He exists as a father and he's created us to enjoy relationship with him as his children. That's who we're meant to be, God's children. And that's why we owe him our devotion and allegiance. It's tragic to read the history of Israel. God had many reasons to abandon them, but they had no reason to abandon God. You know, many people today have abandoned God because life didn't turn out the way they wanted. Trials and sickness and pain and broken dreams have pushed them away. And I think the problem is that many people think that God is a kind of cosmic genie. You know, his job is to grant our wishes, to give us what we want, and to make us happy. But what if that's not his job description? What if he doesn't intend for us to experience heaven while we're here on earth? What if God is more concerned with our holiness and not our happiness? What if God has provided for us in ways that we can't see but we spend most of our time focusing on what we don't have. See, most people wouldn't say they've deserted God or forsaken him, but their lives would say they have. 
their lives would say they've pretty much discarded God. They've walked away from him and turned to something else. Do you see why this is so evil and foolish? Do you see what we're turning from? In verse 12, it says, be appalled, O heavens. It's, it's like God is speaking to the heavens. He's speaking, in a sense, to the angels. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate or dismayed or horrified, declares the Lord. See, those in heaven, the angels and others who are in heaven, can so clearly see the beauty of God. They see his glory. They, they see the joy. Daily they experience this overwhelming glory of God. They, they see with crystal clarity that God is the most satisfying thing in the world. They, they know that we were created for God and that he's the only one that can bring everlasting joy. And they're shocked that people would prefer anything more than God. So that's number one. The Lord is the fountain of satisfaction. Number two, why is this so shocking? Number two, because people prefer broken cisterns. It's not a good idea to turn away from God. It's also not a good idea to turn to something else. The nation of Israel was set apart as God's own people, and God had provided for them in some amazing ways. He delivered them from slavery in Egypt. He defeated powerful enemies. He provided food for them in the desert. He established them in their own land, and he forgave their sins. But they still turned away. They began to worship false gods all around them, gods made of wood and stone and steel. They bowed down to these lifeless idols and preferred these things above the true and living God. They committed spiritual adultery. Again, in verse 13, it says, they hewed out or carved out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The cisterns here represent the false gods. The ancient Middle East had three sources of water. The best was fresh running water, which flows from a a spring or a stream. It's often called living water because it's, it's moving. The next is groundwater, which collects in a well. And the last is runoff water, which is collected in a cistern. A cistern was like a hole dug in, in the ground. So this, this round circle and then dug way down, usually into limestone, and they would plaster it. And the runoff water would just go over the ground and fill it. These cisterns were nasty. They were filled with foul filthy, stagnant water. Think of, think of like a swimming pool that's been neglected for a long time. It, it gets disgusting. And these cisterns were gross. They were filled with insect larvae and mud and scum. Now imagine an incredible fountain in the desert. It is bubbling up with this cool, clear, refreshing water. And imagine that you're hot and thirsty. And instead of drinking from that beautiful, wonderful fountain, you walk right past it and carve out your own leaky cistern that is foul and filthy and can't even hold water. That's what the Israelites are doing by worshiping false gods. They've traded the best water supply for the worst, and their cistern can't even hold water. What made their actions so evil? is that they turned away from the fountain of living water and turned instead to insect-infested sludge. And they expected to find satisfaction. How could they do that? How can we do it? I think one of the main problems is that we lack sight. We don't see the unseen. We, we don't see the beauty and the joy and the worth of God. So we just live for what we can see. People drink from broken, disgusting, foul cisterns all the time because they don't realize that there is living water. I heard a story once about some sailors who, who left from Europe and they were trying to make their way across the Atlantic to South America. And this is in the 1800s, they were on a big clipper ship. 
and they got caught in a terrible storm. And they got turned around and, and lost. They couldn't find their way. And they eventually ran out of food and they, they ended up running out of water. And they were in a lot of trouble. Well, they finally found another ship and they went over to the ship. The ship came to them and they said, give us some water. We're, we're dehydrated. We need water. And one of the other sailors said, well, just dip your buckets down. And the guy said, no, we need fresh water. We need something that we can drink. Please just give us your water. And the guy said, well, just dip your buckets down. And the guy said, no, this is salt. Well, we can't drink this. We're going to die. We're dehydrated. And the guy said again, just dip your buckets down. So finally, one of the sailors got a bucket, threw it over the edge, dipped it down, pulled it up, and it was fresh, clear, cool water. They were sailing and had been sailing for days at the mouth of the Amazon River. Even though they couldn't see land, they couldn't see Brazil, they were sailing in fresh water. The Amazon is so powerful, it pushes fresh water out into the ocean a hundred and 85 miles from shore. There are many people in this world that don't realize that living water is available to them in the person of Jesus Christ. They end up spiritually dehydrated and eventually spiritually dead when all they need to do is dip their buckets down. And that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to dip your bucket down and drink from Christ and his fountain. Another reason we prefer broken cisterns is that they do satisfy at first. They provide some satisfaction. That's why we keep drinking from them. But it seems like our desires keep increasing while our pleasures keep decreasing. That's what sin does. It seems good at first, but in the end, it traps and it kills. The song Hotel California was written by the Eagles, and the Eagles were four Midwestern boys that had made it big. They found themselves in California, and they found themselves becoming more and more famous, and as they began to get into the whole party scene, they, they wrote this song. Don Headley said it's, it's about the dark underbelly of the American dream and about excess in America. Let me read to you some of the lyrics. On a dark desert highway, cool wind in my hair, warm smell of Kalidas, that's a reference to drugs, rising up through the air. Up ahead in the distance, I saw a shimmering light. My head grew heavy and my sight grew dim. I had to stop for the night. There she stood in the doorway. I heard the mission bell. And I was thinking to myself, this could be heaven or this could be hell. And that's often what it's like. Is what I'm experiencing, heaven? is this good or is this bad? Is this heaven or is this hell? Then she lit up a candle and she showed me the way. There were voices down the corridor. I thought I heard them say, welcome to the Hotel California. Such a lovely place, such a lovely face. Plenty of room at the Hotel California. Any time of year, you can find it here. Mirrors on the ceiling, the pink champagne on ice, and she said, we are all just prisoners here of our own device. And in the master's chambers, they gathered for the feast. They stab it with their steely knives, but they just can't kill the beast. And that's often like that pleasure, those highs, trying to get a hold of it. You're trying to, to stab this beast, to have this feast, but you, you can't seem to get it. And then it says this, last thing I remember, I was running for the door. I had to find the passage back to the place I was before. Relax, said the night man. We are programmed to receive. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. A lot of people are living it up at the Hotel California. A lot of people are trying to get water out of broken cisterns. And there can be a lot of company down in the hole, which makes it seem normal. Hey, if everybody's doing this, we can't all be wrong. It's easier to prefer things over God if our friends are doing it too. But the real issue is that we don't believe that God 
will be better than our broken cisterns. Israel's great sin was that they desired things over God. They forsook, they abandoned, they rejected the fountain of God. They, they tasted God and said, I'm not interested. I'm more interested in sex and money and vacations and shows and friends and video games and homes and music and sports. And I'm not that interested in God. Our greatest evil is not that we break God's commandments. It's that we desire things over God. We prefer the creation over the creator. We prefer the gifts over the giver. The problem isn't that we pursue our pleasure when we should be doing our duty. No, it's that we are too easily pleased by the wrong things. C.S. Lewis said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So we go for things that will never satisfy, and we bypass the only one who can satisfy. And nobody seems that shocked by it. In our society, it doesn't shock anyone that people carve out their own cisterns and worship their own gods. It doesn't shock anyone that, that men and women don't read the Bible, that it's not the center of their lives. It doesn't shock anyone that people skip church or rarely pray. It all just seems normal. I mean, we are far more committed to baseball and restaurants and shows and Starbucks and cars and clothes and houses and bands than we are to God. And it doesn't bother anyone. People use God's name as a curse all the time, and it doesn't seem that shocking. His commands are regularly broken, and we don't even blink an eye. People get divorced. They lie. They commit adultery. They disobey their parents, cheat on taxes. People hate one another and complain, are bitter and unforgiving, and it doesn't bother anyone. It doesn't seem shocking, but it is to God. What cistern? are you currently trying to drink from? What do you prefer above God? Let me ask you another question. What if you were on that ship at the mouth of the Amazon, you couldn't see land, and you didn't believe that you were sailing on fresh water? It seemed too good to be true, and you passed it up. What do you do? Is it too late for you? Well, in John chapter 4, Jesus meets a Samaritan woman by this well. And this woman, her life is a mess. She has had five husbands. She is living and sleeping with another man. Her life is full of shame and regret. She's rejected by her people. She is very, very far from God. And Jesus asks her for a drink of water. She's shocked that he would ask her, a Jew and a man asking her, a Samaritan woman, for a drink is shocking. And then this is what Jesus says in John chapter 4 and verse 10. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In other words, he's saying, lady, if, if you knew who I was, if you knew that I was the Son of God, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. I would give you something that could satisfy your soul. They continue the conversation, and then in verse 13, Jesus says, everyone who drinks this water, and he's probably pointing to the well. They were standing right there at Jacob's well. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus wanted to give this sinful Samaritan woman living water. He wanted to give it to her. He wanted to give her satisfaction. 
And he wants to do the same for you. You're not too far away. Your life is not too messed up. Your sins are not too big for him to forgive. It's not too late for you. Jesus came from heaven to bring you back to the fountain, to bring sinners back to God, to satisfy our souls in God. God is the fountain of living water. He is the source of satisfaction. He doesn't want you to waste your life trying to get water out of useless cisterns. He doesn't want you to perish. God the Father loved you so much that he forsook his only son. You forsook God and he forsook Christ. He crushed his only son so that you could come to the waters and be satisfied in God. Jesus Christ drank the sludge from your broken cisterns so that you could drink the living water from the fountain of life. In a very real sense, Jesus is the pipeline that brings us living water. Joy and satisfaction come rushing from God to us through Jesus. And all you have to do is dip your buckets down. It's absolutely free. In Isaiah 55, in verse 1, it says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And then it says in John 7, 37, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. We can drink without price because Jesus paid the price. And he paid the price because he wants us to be satisfied in him. You simply have to turn from the broken cisterns that have left you empty and dry. Renounce and forsake and abandon these useless pursuits and pleasures and just go to the fountain. Go to the fountain and drink and drink until you are satisfied. Go to the one that can eternally satisfy your soul. God is not asking you to be a good person. He's not asking you to merit this or to earn it. He's just calling you to drink. And we drink by putting our full trust and faith in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross to forgive us of our sins. We drink by turning from the broken cisterns and turning to the Savior. We drink by preferring the fountain of living water over all the broken cisterns of this world. <laughs> 